today to join us for our worship service. We're glad you're here. We hope that everybody is safe and sound wherever you are, but that you are joining us in spirit. Right now, let us begin with prayer. Father, we've come into your presence and we say thank you. Thank you for the gift of your love. Thank you that you never leave us, that you're always with us. And thank you that we do have the ability to come together in this form of worship and offer praise to you. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Will you join me in singing one verse of Love Lifted Me? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, Solomon, as he's writing the book of Ecclesiastes, tells us that there's a time for everything. Last week, we talked about there being a time to be a Martha and be busy doing things, and also time to be a Mary and sit at the foot of Jesus. We talked about with all the uncertainty of this time, that now is the time that we need to be more like Mary. We need to be more sitting at the feet, listening to what Jesus has to say. We all need to take that time to draw closer to God, to bask in his presence, and to revel in his love. You know, as I listen to the passage today, I think of the seasons that God has created. You got winter, spring, summer, fall. I like the variety in this world. I have some friends who like winter. Some of you like summer. But uh, I'm a little bit more like Goldilocks. One's too cold and one's too hot. I'm looking for the one that's just right. Now my mother loves fall. She likes the crisp air. She likes the many colored leaves. But my favorite is spring. Granted, there's no crisp air in the spring. It's full of pollen. You've got pine pollen and oak tree pollen and all sorts of pollen of every kind. But I still like to be outside just as much as I can. I like to look at all the different flowers, see the many colors, smell the different fragrances. What are my first hints that spring is coming? One of my first hints is when I look out and I see the Japanese magnolia in bloom. I see those pink and purple blossoms and I know spring is on its way. And then when spring does arrive, what do we have? Azaleas, dogwoods, and wisteria. Of all the spring flowers, my favorite is wisteria because it has so much to teach us. And I know so many of us have a love-hate relationship with wisteria. But I wanna talk about it today. And as I talk about wisteria, I want you to think about sin. 
and see if you can see the correlation between wisteria and sin. See how sin is like the wisteria. If you go out in the yards today, you, you look around the yards, you look in the woods, you look in the... If you go out in the yards today, you, you look around the yards, you look in the woods, you look in the middle of all your flowers, you look in the trees, and you're going to see wisteria. It's climbing and growing everywhere. Now, every once in a while, we'll see some white wisteria, but normally what we see is the purple. And we see these long cascading blossoms of purple, and we smell the sweet aroma. When I was in seminary, sometimes I would have to drive from classes in Augusta up to due west. And along the way, I passed the little town called Edgewood. And as you neared the town of Edgewood, there was a place about the size of two city blocks that was solid wisteria. You know, you roll your window down your drive, you could just smell it. Well, one day I was there a little early, so I just pulled off on the side of the road. I turned off the engine, I rolled down my window, and I just sat there watching, smelling, and just taking all that the wisteria had to offer. Have you ever planted wisteria in your yard? My dad did once. It was a challenge. He planted it once. He thought it would make the yard have a beautiful plant, and it did. You know, it quickly grew. It needed no maintenance. Soon we had lovely flowers, this pleasing aroma coming forth. But the problem was it didn't stop there. The wisteria wanted to reach over and climb our pear tree that was right next to it. And as it came close to the pear tree, it sent out those tiny little tendrils, and they would wrap themselves around the branches of the pear tree. Those sweet, gentle little tendrils became strong as iron and impossible to move from that pear tree. You know, it was a constant battle between pruning and pulling to keep the wisteria out of the pear tree. But if we didn't wage that battle, we know that eventually the wisteria would choke the life out of the pear tree. But it didn't stop there. It's, what does mysteria, wisteria do? It sends little roots underground, and they go all over the yard trying to find another place to pop up and grow again. What started out as a tempting pleasure turned into a nightmare. The beauty and the sweet fragrance were now far overshadowed by the invasive tenacity of the plant. Do you see how that's a lot like sin? Do you see how sin and wisteria can be so much alike? Remember, sin is not just some major evil that we do. I mean, we know that murder and stealing are sin, and we know that lying and cheating are sin, but sin is anything that breaks our relationship with God. Being glued in front of the television set, being tied to our phones is sin. Overeating is sin because we're doing damage to our body, which is the temple of God. Gossiping is sin. Turning our backs on those in need is sin. And anyone who has an addiction can see the correlation between wisteria and sin. That first temptation that started out as one simple act of pleasure whether smoking, drinking, drugs, pornography, soon had a grip on us and wouldn't let us go. The beauty and the fragrance of the wisteria drew us in. Then its tendrils took hold of us. And it's just as hard to break the bonds of sin as it is to get rid of wisteria. We try to resist one time. We try to find something to substitute in its place. And we try, and we try, and we fail. Time after time, we fail. I like the way the writer of the book of Hebrews puts it in chapter 12. And he's talking about all those Christians that have gone on before us. And this is what he says. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. The sin that so easily entangles. Such so true words. So how do we get out of it? You know, what do we do with all that sin? We're just laying at the foot of the cross. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, we find these words. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So today, get rid of the wisteria. Call in the heavy artillery. Dig out the root. Today, fall at the foot of the cross and ask Christ's forgiveness and his help in attacking your wisteria. And all God's people said, Amen. as I am. Just as I am without a dream, but that my blood was shed for thee, and that thou didst become to thee, O Lamb of God, I accepting us just as we are, allowing us to come before you to confess our sins and have you wash them clean. Help us, Lord, this week to find any wisteria that grows and remove it from our life by giving it to you. And now we ask that you would go with us, guide us and direct us and use us as you see fit. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Amen.